So the book of Ephesians tells us that you and I are not citizens of this earth, but that we are citizens of heaven. We don't belong here. We are aliens of this earth. We are sojourners. The Bible tells us we are pilgrims. Doesn't mean that we have a hat on with a buckle in front of it. It means that we're just passing through. Well, we get, I think, personal opinion, way too involved in this world. We get way too rooted in this world. We aren't connected enough with the kingdom of God. And so those aren't the things that are really driving us. What ends up driving us are things about this world. We get outraged about things of this world when, hey, there's plenty of things to get outraged about. Do you want to be outraged? Man, there's a lot of it out there that you can be outraged about. But we have been given, uh, we are part of the kingdom of God. We have joined his kingdom. And Jesus is going to bring this up because he was in a synagogue on a Sunday. He is teaching. There was a woman there who was bent over and Jesus laid his hands on her. He didn't always lay his hands on people to heal them, by the way. Most often he spoke to people. Pick up your bed and go home. The guy, the paralytic's like, okay. And he's able to do it. But for this particular woman, he set her free. He released her from this infirmity. And the leader of the synagogue was all upset. Here's a man who was a, a shepherd. He should have been a, a spiritual authority. He should have been a proper shepherd to these people. And when this woman was released from 18 years of this debilitating illness, he should have rejoiced with her he should have rejoiced and praised God over what had been done for a woman that had been put under his care. But instead, he was upset. There are six days for you to come and be healed. Don't do it on the Sabbath day. And Jesus rebuked him. Jesus called him a hypocrite to his face. You hypocrite. You loose your donkey and take it to water. And this woman has been loosed from this infirmity for, for 18 years. And you're upset with that. And it identifies that there's a problem within the kingdom of God. Remember, Israel in the Old Testament was God's established kingdom. He's the one who established it. He took Abraham and he built the nation of Israel out of it. So it, it is a work that God did, but here's this false shepherd. And now we have the church, which again is Jesus establishing it. He's the one who built his church, he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So we know we're going to be effective, but there are going to be false shepherds in the church as well. Not only false shepherds, but false believers. So he's going to identify this problem. All right. Let me give you just a few things about the kingdom of God. I've got six of them. I want to go through them quickly. Number one, all people are subject to the kingdom. Everyone is. <clears throat> if you're here today and you're not a believer and maybe you've been drugged to church, I'm sorry, you're here. Won't be that long. All right. Uh, but you might think, well, I'm not subject to the kingdom of God because I'm not part of it. No, you are. It's just you won't be subject until the very end. At the end of the book of Revelation, it says, and all the rest of the dead are resurrected and the books are opened and they are judged. This is the second death. You not only have to fear the first death, but you fear the second death and you will one day have to answer to the king of the kingdom. In Psalms 103, 19, it says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven. This is the kingdom of God, his throne in heaven, and his kingdom is over all. Not only that, his kingdom is eternal. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. That's just the information, the knowledge that we know that we are not finite, that we are not, that we have an eternity. And it's good that God placed that inside of us because we need to know that. We are eternal. The Bible also says in Romans that God has placed within everyone the, the concept that God exists. That they know God exists because it's been placed inside of them by God. I'm not saying an atheist who, doesn't say, who says, I don't believe in God, that he really believes in God. I'm saying he's pushed that away. He's fought against that and he's pushed that away. I'm not calling him a liar. I'm simply saying he's pushed that away. The third thing about the kingdom of God is that his kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom is not of this world. We get really wrapped up in this world. We spend a lot of the time investing in this world. We hate the way the world is going. And ever since COVID, there's been this acceleration of things taking place. And they're talking about a reset 
And I want to just say resets are coming. They, they are coming. There needs to be a financial reset because all the nations of the world are in massive debt. It's not just the United States who's close to $30 trillion in debt. And sometimes I don't think we understand how much a trillion dollars is, but it's just such a massive amount, so much more than a billion. And there, there are examples that you can do to help people understand it. But there's resets coming and we're like, well, I, I, the, the world, I don't like that this is happening to the world. Well, we're not part of this world. We're part of the kingdom of God. Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But, my, but now my kingdom is not from here. During the millennial, when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem on the throne of David, his kingdom will be here. But, and, and the world will be renewed during that time. But not now. It's not, it's not from this world. Uh, number four, you must be born into this kingdom. You are born into this world. There, there's not a person on this world that hasn't been born of the flesh. And you must be born into the kingdom of God. You can't just sign a paper to join. You got to be born. Listen to what Jesus said in John 3, 5, and 6. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So here we have the kingdom of God again. And people say, some people say, well, the water here is baptism, so you gotta be, you gotta be baptized and of the Spirit. That's not what the water is here. All right, baptism is important. Christians should be baptized. It's not salvation. There's a doctrine called um, baptismal regeneration, which teaches that you go and get baptized and that's when you're saved, it's false. It's not true. That would be a work. Paul said, if salvation were by a work, then grace would no longer be grace, which is just a really great argument. He's like, grace is undeserved. If you do a work for it, then it's not grace anymore. I think Paul's just kind of going, this is pretty obvious stuff that's here. But what does the water mean then? It, it, it's the amniotic fluid. It's being born. Every person in here was born. There's not a person here who wasn't born. You were born of the flesh. Jesus goes on to say, you've got to be born of water and the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he says this, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You've got to be born of the water and Spirit. Flesh is flesh and Spirit is spirit. It just tells us you're born of the flesh and you must be born of the Spirit. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the garden, they died. God said, on the day you eat it, you will die. They died eventually physically, but they died spiritually the moment they ate it. And theologians argue whether or not the spirit has gone dormant in mankind or dead, which cracks me up because theologians will argue about anything. And I love that they're there because they pour a lot of time into things that I don't want to, and I'm able to glean from them. <laughs> However, they argue over things that are like, whether your spirit, if you don't know Christ today, and your spirit is dormant or dead, God's going to bring it to life. God's going to quicken it. He's going to revive it or he's going to bring it to life because that's what God does. And the Bible uses this terminology not only here, but in a lot of places that your spirit has been reborn. It uses those terms in the epistles several times. So you are born into this kingdom. And if you have not been, then maybe today would be your day of glory when you will be given eternity and born into the kingdom of God. The... The fifth thing the Bible says about it is that the Son of Man will rule this kingdom. Now, this is the Old Testament. Uh, we Christians are sometimes accused of making things up for Jesus, that he got crucified, so we said that that's a sacrifice for sin. Um, Jesus made a couple claims to be God, and so we point to the Old Testament and say, that Jesus was God based on these passages. But the Old Testament's clear. Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. The human who was going to be born was going to be called God. And a sign was going to be given that a virgin would conceive and bear a child, and his name would be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. So we know there's a human who is going to be called God with us. This is all Old Testament. Well, there's another Old Testament passage which tells us that a human is going to rule forever in the kingdom of God. It's going to be a human who does it. This is really important for us 
and this is in Daniel chapter 7, we know written long before the New Testament. And here Daniel's having a vision. Listen to what he says. This is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I was watching in a night vision and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Now the word Son of Man there simply means human. Notice that's one like the Son of Man. So he's Son of Man. He's like the Son of Man. So he's Son of Man, but he's different. Okay? So there comes one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. I don't think we have any doubt who the Ancient of Days is, right? He's the Father. He comes to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near to him. Then to him was given, this is the, the, the human, the Son of Man, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom it's, is one which shall not be destroyed. So when Jesus is arrested, he stands before two high priests. We're going to get into that. We're, we're making our way through Luke. We're going to get into the whole arrest, trials, crucifixion of Jesus, suffering, crucifixion of Jesus. Not long from now. Uh, but Jesus is standing before Caiaphas. Annas is the real high priest. And Caiaphas is the puppet high priest. And Jesus stands before both of them. And when he's interviewed by Caiaphas, Caiaphas says to him, and this is the official Sanhedrin meeting at nighttime. I don't know how official it was. It was illegal for them to meet at night. It was also illegal for them to cross-examine witnesses. They did it anyway. They said to, uh, Caiaphas said to Jesus, are you the son of man? Uh, excuse me, are you the son of God? And Jesus said, it is as you say. But from here on out, you will see the son of man coming in the clouds of glory, given dominion, power, and a kingdom. And Caiaphas screamed blasphemy, tore his clothes because Jesus was claiming to be the one who would have the kingdom forever and ever. He was claiming deity and he tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of a trial? He has committed things worthy of death. So Jesus applied this passage to himself. The sixth thing about the kingdom of God is that we are to be about the kingdom. We get way too wrapped up in this world, which I've already said, and we don't put a lot of energy into the kingdom of God. But as believers, we're supposed to be about the kingdom. Jesus said in John 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God. You got to take care of your life, right? You got to wear clothes. You got to, you, you get paid. You got to pay your bills. You got to, you got to make your way through life but seek first the kingdom of God. Let that be your highest priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. In context, that these things are your, your, your needs. I heard somebody say one time that these things are your wants. I don't know what Bible you're reading. Doesn't mean that you get everything you want. I don't get everything I want. Do you get everything you want? But we do have our needs taken care of. And so we're to be about God's business. God says, if you'll be about my business and seek first the kingdom of God, I'll be about your business. I'm going to take care of these things. This is really good to know. And that whole section is on worry, by the way. So if you're worrying, you know, maybe you heard me talk about a financial reset and you're like, oh, God, God will take care of you. Be about his business first. All right. And, and God will do it. So there's some ideas about the kingdom of God. Let me also just say that sometimes in the New Testament, you're going to read the kingdom of God and other times you're going to read the kingdom of heaven. And there are people that like to make distinctions between them because they want the kingdom of heaven to be a mysterious thing that God does. That they, it's just, it's not true. When you read them, remember, not everybody was working off of the same dictionary or th thesaurus. And so sometimes they would make a statement and call something the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes it's the kingdom of God. It's the same thing. When you just read it in context and you see there's not a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. I just wanted to point that out because that can be a little bit confusing. So, Jesus now wants to bring up the kingdom of heaven because you have this person who's a part of this, of, of Judaism, which God established, but they're obviously a false teacher. And he wants to point out that this is going to continue in the church. He establishes the church, but there are going to be false teachers within the church. We're warned about that on several occasions. And we know that as the last days get closer, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 4 that men are going to lose character. 
They're going to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They're going to have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny his power. We also know that there are going to be many false teachers who are giving heeds to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. If you want homework on that, 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4. Pretty easy to remember those two sections. And they will tell us that as we get, go further into the last days, these things are going to get worse. All right? So Jesus brings up the kingdom of God. He wants to point out this problem. So he says in verse 18 of Luke 13, and here's our text. And if you're visiting with us, we go line by line, verse by verse through books of the Bible. We're currently in Luke. We started in Luke 1, verse 1. We're now in Luke 13, verses 10 through um, 30. So he says in verse 18, Then he said, What is the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden, and it grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Now there's a couple of different ways in which people take this passage. There is a doctrine called um, kingdom theology, or domain theology, or dominion, excuse me, dominion theology. And it was very popular in the late 1800s. And this is the idea that we as Christians are just supposed to Christianize the world. That sooner or later, politi Christian politicians are going to get in power. Christian leaders are going to be, and, and, we're, and then we're going to Christianize the world. And then we're going to hand the world over to Jesus when he returns. That was very popular in the 1800s. And then came World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. And it wasn't very popular after that. But there's a resurgence of it today. And there are people once again teaching it. The Bible tells us that things are going to get worse and worse as time goes on. And that's what we're seeing. We aren't seeing us Christianize the world. If the church is going to Christianize the world, they're doing a pretty pathetic job of it now. We have less influence in the world today than we have had in the past. And that is because we're heading towards the last days when things are going to get really bad. No, what Jesus is saying is this that the kingdom of God is going to get abnormally large. Let me point that out. So he says, what is the kingdom of God like? It is, um, what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed when a man took it and planted it in his garden. You don't plant a tree in your garden. You plant plants in your garden because he wants to get mustard from it, right? And it grew and became a large tree. Now, a mustard plant doesn't grow into a tree. I found this on plantvillage.edu. So you can look it up. And it tells us about the mustard plant. It says mustard plants are thin herbicus. I have no idea what that word means. Herbs, herbs with yellow flowers. The leaves of the plant are toothed, lobed, and occasionally have a larger terminal, or occasionally have larger terminal lobes. Plants can reach 16 centimeters, which of course all of you guys know exactly how tall that is. If we were in Europe... That is six feet, three inches. So a mustard plant is, is wispy and about six feet tall and fills whole fields. When, when we go to Israel in the spring, we usually go every other year. We haven't been in for a couple of years. We have one scheduled for 22. We'll see if we can go in April of 22. Uh, but when we get to a place called Tel Dan, it's a place where there's just wild mustard growing everywhere. And there's these huge fields of this yellow which is amazing. And it's, we all stop and take pictures at it because it's just having these mustard plants behind you. It, it reminds me of the Palo Verde trees blooming yellow here. Remember a couple years ago, we had that really wild year where I all bloomed at the same time and they all stained blossom. Me and my wife went up to Push Ridge area, hiked back there, took some pictures because it was absolutely incredible. That's what it reminds me of. But they're not trees. So he's saying it's going to become abnormally large. And then when it says the birds of the air nest in the branches. Birds in the parable are evil. Not in the Bible. Sometimes birds in the Bible are not evil, but birds in the parables are, are evil. Hermeneutics is the, the, the principle of how you study the Bible. There are certain rules that you use when you study the Bible to make sure that you don't twist things. Hermeneutics are those rules. And there's a principle of consistency in the rules of hermeneutics. Doesn't mean it can't be broken, okay? But it means it's just a general rule you work off of. And the rule is, is that if in the parable something stands for something, then you should take it consistently unless there's a reason not to. Just makes pretty good sense, right? And so birds in the parables are evil. And there's no reason for us to think that these birds aren't evil. Especially since he's talking about a false, rule, uh, false synagogue leader. 
So what he's saying here is that the church is going to become abnormally large and that evil is going to fill its wings, which is a drag. But we know this from other, pla other places as well. Jesus told us that there's a man that went out and planted wheat in a field and his enemy came along and sowed tares and the tares grew up with the wheat. And this is an analogy of the church. The enemy is putting wheat, a tares, among the genuine Christians, the wheat. And he says, don't try to tear the, the tares out now because you'll make a mistake and you'll grab some of the wheat, but wait until judgment. In other words, God knows. And so I'm not supposed to stand up here today and look around and go, which one of you? And because you guys, <laughs> because you guys have chosen to come to the church that I pastor, certainly there's no tares here at all. You guys are all genuine wheat. No, really, I'm not supposed to try to judge who's wheat and who's tares because just let God take care of it. God will handle it. Now, I'm, we, we aren't super happy that the church has people who aren't really Christians because they're representing us as well. They say they're Christians. They act like Christians. They talk like Christians. Unfortunately, they don't walk like Christians. There are things in their lives that shouldn't be there. We also know there are going to be false leaders. Jesus told us this often. There are going to be false shepherds. There are going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's what he was dealing with there. These are people, and, and I, look, I could talk about all of the ways today in which this is, is true. There are churches that don't teach the gospel. There are churches that do their own thing. There are churches that are more concerned about being popular than they are about really teaching the truth. Uh, there are so many false churches that are out there that this has just become very evident to us and is very true. He uses another parable in verse 20. Again, same thing. Again, he said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. So leaven in the Bible is a type of sin. And when you take leaven, um, I went to San Francisco now some 30 years ago, went down to a place by the wharf to eat. They told us that they were using leaven from 120 years ago. I guess that'd be 150 years ago now if they're still doing it. But that at the end of every night, they take a bit of the dough that they had leavened and they mix that with the dough for the next day. And overnight, the leaven through fermentation covers the entire lump. So it's all leavened. And now when you bake it, it's puffy. That's the idea. And so it goes through the whole lump. And so there, there's going to be some sin that's going to enter the church and it's going to go through the whole church. Again, this isn't good news, right? We don't want that. We wish it wasn't the case. I wish the church was genuinely pure. I wish the church genuinely didn't have false believers and false leaders in it. But Jesus wants us to know they're there so that we don't go just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you're saying what's right. We want to study the scriptures to make sure the things that are taught are real. And we are told personally to make sure we're not deceived and that we are to rightly divide the word of God. So you can listen to what I say, but check me out. See whether or not the things that I'm saying are true. And I think over time you can learn if you can trust someone or not. But anytime somebody gets upset that you're, that they're, that you're checking out what they say, note that as a problem. If you come up to me after a service and say, Robert, you taught this, but the Bible says this, I'm never offended at that, even when I'm wrong. I don't like being wrong, right? I'm just like you. I don't like being wrong. I'm like Fonzie. I can't say I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong, but it's not true. I've been wrong too many times to not be able to say I'm wrong. But I, don't, I, I like the fact that you check out what I say. And so what happens to false teachers is when you check out what they say, they say, don't touch God's anointed. You're not supposed to touch God's anointed. And they're all upset about it. You know what you do then? You leave that church and you go find another church. You get out of there because they're not being held responsible for what they're teaching. And if they can't make a change, hey, which one of us is 100% right? Which pastor teaches something that's 100% right? I'm going to give you the answer to that, all right? Zero. There's always going to be some things that are wrong that need to be corrected. But we want to be able to be a part of what is true and real. So Luke now gives us another story at the end of these two that Jesus tells us the church is going to be abnormally large, which talks about how to get into it. How do we get into the kingdom? So in verse 22, it says, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Next week, we're going to talk, our whole study next week will be about Jerusalem. We're going to talk about what it was for Jesus, 
what, the, what Jesus talked about, the future of Jerusalem, and why Jesus wept over Jerusalem, because that's our next text. He weeps. He stops, and he weeps over Jerusalem. So um, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he said, uh, and someone said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? So somebody is coming down the road and said, hey, Lord, I got a, are there few who are saved? Now, now, Jesus just pinpoints on this guy. Jesus just doesn't answer his question. He turns to him and basically says, don't you worry about other people. You worry about yourself. Look at what he says. He said, and he said to them, verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow gate. He could have just answered him. Yep, only a few. But he said, you strive to enter into the narrow gate. Make sure you get into heaven the proper way. And it's not a broad gate. It's a narrow gate. He says, I say to you, um, or excuse me, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. There's a lot of people who are going, I'm going I'm to go to heaven. I'm going to make it into heaven, but they're not going to enter. Why? Because you think going to church saves you. Because you think being a good person saves you. Because you think if I, I raise my hand and pray a prayer, I'm saved. And it doesn't matter whether my life has been transformed. You think you're okay, but you're not. And there's going to be many people like that. This is really important. There's going to be many people that are like that. So he says, you make sure to enter in. And then he says, verse 25, when once the master of the house has raised up and shut the door and begun to stand outside and lock the door, saying, there are going to be those who are standing outside, beginning to say, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to them, I don't know you. Where are you from? And they will say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. We're familiar with you. Let us in. Now, this talks about the end of the age. Right now, there's a, a door of grace that's open and you can enter into heaven by that door of grace. One day that door will be shut. No one else will be able to make it in. It'll all be wrapped up. And people are going to say, I should be in there. And Jesus says, I don't know you. Where are you from? And they say, we, you taught in our streets. You, I, we, we, we read your Bible. We went to church. We, we know you. And he says, I don't know you. This isn't the only place Jesus told us that not knowing him is the problem. In another place, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In another place, he says that some are going to say, didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And Jesus will say to them, away from me, for I never knew you. In other words, you, you might be involved in ministry and you might, I don't know whether they really cast out demons or really did miracles, but they said they did. They thought they did. Lord, we did miracles in your names. We did, we cast out demons. Sometimes we have a false sense of security for the wrong reasons. We want to make sure we don't do that because it's only knowing him. It's only having a relationship with him. When I was a teenager, way back when, in the 70s, there was a popular t-shirt that said, it's a relationship, not religion. The idea was you got to know God. You can't just be religious. There was a popular song on the radio that said, praise God, I'm not religious anymore. I just love the Lord. That's the concept. I don't know that I like the whole idea that we're not religious because we do go to church weekly. We do take communion regularly. And the world thinks of what religion is in knowing God. I don't know that that's a great argument, but I do like the t-shirt. It's a relationship, not religion, because religion ain't going to save you. You can be a really religious person. You're not going to be saved. You've got to know him. This means you've got to have a relationship with him. And so I'll ask you, do you know him? Have you invited him in? Have you received him? Do you interact with him? Do you spend time with him? Are you excited about the things of God? Are you about the kingdom of God? Do you know him? So Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is his, his real, the real Lord's prayer. And it's a great prayer where he prays for his disciples and the church before he is crucified. John 17. And in verse 3, he says this. And this is eternal life. This is Jesus telling us what eternal life is. You have people that'll tell you if you speak in tongues, you have eternal life or you get baptized, you have eternal life. All of that, I'm, I don't care about. First of all, it's not in the Bible. Secondly, Jesus tells me what eternal life is and it's none of that. He says, this is eternal life 
that you may know, excuse me, that you may, let me read it correctly. This is eternal life, that they may know you, he's talking to God, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. It's about knowing him. Just like he said, away from me, I never knew you. And not everyone who says, Lord, Lord's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to know him. You have to be in a relationship with him, which means you have to maintain that relationship. And you say, well, how do I maintain a relationship with God? Same way you maintain a relationship with other people. You talk with them. You hang out with them. You, you interact with them. You say, well, I've never had God speak to me. But you have his word that you can read and study and know. And when I committed my life to Christ when I was 13 years old, I suddenly had a hunger for God's Word. I didn't have it before. I'd grown up in the church. I was baptized into the Methodist church as a baby. My parents went to church every single week. When I was in fifth grade in Sunday school, I got a star on every single week. We had a little poster up. We put stars down for the weeks we attended. I don't know why we didn't ever go on vacation, but we didn't. And I made every single Sunday at church that year. So that when I go into, I go into uh, MYF, which is the youth meeting there, I'm 13 years old, and one of our youth pastors says to me, are you going to heaven? It's not a bad way to bring up spirituality, by the way. Are you going to heaven? I said, yeah. And he said, why? I said, because I believe in God. I had been taught, and I don't know about other Methodist churches, I just know about the one I grew up in, that if you believe God existed, then that's what it took to get to heaven. I believe he exists. If I don't believe in the existence of God, I'm not going to make it to heaven. If I do believe in the existence of God, I'm going to make it to heaven. So he said to me, does the devil believe in God? And I said, yeah. He said, is the devil going to heaven? And he said, no. And he said, then it takes more than just believing he exists. To believe in him means you trust him and you follow him and you believe what he says. You want to do what he says and you need to receive him. And he said, pray with me if you want to. And I had never heard it before. This is the first time I ever really heard the gospel. And so I prayed. I wonder how many people you know that have never heard the gospel that if they really heard the gospel would actually respond like I did. I was just ready. I just needed someone to, to share it with me. And so I received Christ as my Savior. Now listen to what Jesus goes on to say here when he talks about those that are outside banging on the door. In verse 27, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's the deal. You have to take care of your iniquity. That's what the cross was all about. Jesus suffered and died to take care of your iniquity. Verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out, which is a horrifying thought. You think you're in, you think you're okay because you went to church, because you were religious, because you were trying to be a good person, but now you are shut out of the kingdom of God. And they will come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there, those who are least will be first, and the first will be least. In other words, he's saying, because you think you're religious, because you think you're okay and a good person, you're actually going to be last. But those that are last, that come to him and ask him for forgiveness and have a relationship with him, they're going to be first. So if you think, I'm okay, because I grew up in church or I'm okay because I go to church or I'm okay because I'm a religious person or I'm okay because I'm a good person, make sure you're not the last because the first will be last and the last will be first. And you need to have a genuine relationship with Christ. How does that start? It starts by us believing in him, receiving him. John 1, 12, as many as receive him, he gives the power to become a child of God to those who believe in his name. So you believe him, you trust him and you receive him. You invite him into your life. Now, it doesn't matter to me how you do that. In the Bible, there were all kinds of different ways people got saved. And at, just at some point, make that commitment to him, invite him into your life. And I want to give you that opportunity at the end of this study, as we talk about perhaps being shut out from the kingdom of God, because we want to be genuine. The enemy is a deceiver. He wants to make you think there's some other way. I had a friend of mine, he was actually a relative, who is part of the Church of Christ that believes in baptismal regeneration. And he used to argue with me about baptism being salvation. And I would argue with back with him. And um, this is why I was a youth pastor in Calvary of Albuquerque. And then all of a sudden I made a statement about Jesus being God. And he said to me, Jesus isn't God. And I went, oh, what do you mean? And he goes, Jesus isn't God. Bob never says that. And it dawned on me, he doesn't really know the Lord. He, he, I'm arguing with him like he's a Christian, 
when he thinks he's okay because he was baptized. He never went on in a relationship with God because he, was, because he was baptized and he thought he was okay. That's the danger of a work that makes you think you're saved. And that could be any work that makes you think you're saved. You think you're okay when you're not. And I began to interact with him now as if he had never made a commitment to Christ. I began to witness with him and share with him and to try to get him to realize he needed to have a relationship with Christ and invite Christ into his life. And you may have something in your mind that you think you're okay. The only thing that's okay is that you are born again, that your spirit has come to life and that you now have a relationship with Jesus. Otherwise, you will be shut outside of the kingdom of God. Stand with me, would you, and let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, which doesn't mince words here, which doesn't make it unclear about how we are to get into heaven and that you told this man, strive to make sure you enter into the kingdom of God because one day you may be shut out because you think you're okay. And for him, it was because he was part of the nation of Israel. How many people from the nation of Israel thought they were okay when they will be shut out of the kingdom of God? Lord, I pray for those that are here that think they, that they are okay, that they would make the next step and commit their lives to you. And we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed, please, and your eyes closed for just a couple of minutes. I'd also like to ask that no one would leave early. We're almost done. We'll dismiss you here momentarily. This will not take a long time. But I want to give you an opportunity if you're here today and you've never received him. You, you have to respond. God initiates. The Bible says in John 6, no one comes to the Son unless the Father first draws him which means that there are people here today that God's drawing. He's saying, I want you. I, and you respond by raising your hand or praying a prayer or surrendering your life to him. You respond from a heart that turns towards God and says, I want to know you and I want to love you. And if you have never received him as your savior, if you have never started that relationship with him, then I want to give you an opportunity to do that today that you can know that you are saved. And the Bible tells us that we should have that confidence that we have that helmet of salvation that's on. So if you're here today and you have never taken time to invite Christ in to say, I'm now going to be a part of the kingdom of God. I'm now going to live for God and I'm no longer going to live for myself or for this world because I, am, I want to be a part of God's kingdom and not part of the kingdom of this world. Then I'm going to ask you to do something simple right where you are. Just raise your hand. By raising your hand, you're saying, I want Christ in my life. Lift your hand up now. Lift it up high so I can see it. I want to take time to acknowledge your hand and respond. God bless you, ma'am. Down here to my right. God bless you up there in the balcony. That's awesome. Just lift your hand up now. Again, lift it up high. God bless you, sir, out in the pavilion. That's great. God bless you there. Child there with his hand raised. That's awesome. That's great. Just lift up your hand now. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to live for him. God bless you, sir. Under the balcony. God bless you, sir. Back over here. And ma'am, all the way back over. That's awesome. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. The idea is if God's speaking to you today, there's no guarantee he will speak to you in the future. Then respond today because today is the day of salvation. Don't say, I'm going to do it after I get married. I'm going to do it. At, give your life to him today. So I'm going to take scan the room one more time. I'm not going to go on and on. If you want to give your life to Christ, then raise your hand. Lift your hand up now. Lift it up high. All right, if you're watching online, you can respond as well. You don't need to raise your hand, but you can just say, I want Christ in my life. And if you're listening on the radio and you wonder, what have I tuned into? You've tuned into a live service where we're giving people a chance to commit their lives to Christ and you can do it as well. Um, I, you can put your hands down. And I would like everyone, including those who raise their hand to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess that I've sinned. And I know my sin has separated me from you. I also understand I can be forgiven by the death of Jesus on the cross. So I invite you into my life. I turn from my sin that I can live for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Welcome to the family of God. Amen. Very, very exciting. I'm excited for you, but I want to tell you something. That is that raising your hand doesn't make you saved and praying a prayer doesn't make you saved. And you might say, then why did you have me raise my hand and pray a prayer? Because that's the point of faith by which you were giving God your heart. 
It's the desire to know him and walk with him and, the, and wanting to receive him into your life. And that's just the way you responded. The thief on the cross who wanted the same thing said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, I wish I could have you raise your hand, but you can't, so I don't know, can make it into heaven. Um, I just want to point that out because I don't want there to be confusion that you think, well, I now raised my hand. Now I'm a Christian. Now I, I you know, I, I prayed a prayer. Now I'm a Christian. No, you got to get to know him. Now this is the beginning of a relationship. Your spirit has been brought to life, which is an amazing thing. And you are now going to start interacting with God and everything's going to change. You're going to become hungry to know him and want to know him. Now we have a new believers table off to my right. We've got a new believers team. These people are great. You're going to love them. Stop by the table, get a Bible, get a new believer's packet. We want to let us, let us come alongside of you and help you in your relationship with Christ. Online, if you responded, then you can send us an, an email to saved at calvarytucson.com. Tell us your story. And we have people who will respond and interact with you in that email. You could also send us a text, ready for Jesus to 94,000. The link you get back is our new believer's card. Click on that link, fill that out, and we will have someone who will respond to you promptly. All right? Now I want to pray for you guys. And I like to pray for you based upon some of the things that we've been studying. So here's what I'm thinking for us. We want to be witnesses for Christ. We want to be able to share with people around us. We want to be that person like the youth pastor who asked me, are you going to heaven? We want God to open up those doors and lead us. Some of us are terrified to do that but God has given you the Holy Spirit and can open up doors. So I want to pray for you in boldness to be able to share your faith and that God might give you through the leading of the Spirit. Remember, it's not methods, right? It's not us with certain methods, how to get people saved. It's God's Spirit working inside of you and in the lives of people around you. And I, th there are people you know, co-workers, acquaintances, family members who are ready to receive Jesus if they just hear the message of the gospel. The harvest is white, it's ready, Jesus said. So I wanna pray for you. So the Bible says, let men everywhere lift up holy hands and pray. I'm gonna ask you to lift up your hands to pray. Men and women, by the way, that's the generic sense of women. So don't tell me women aren't supposed to have their hands up. Stop it. Uh, men and women, you raise your hand and let's pray. Father, we wanna thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be able to learn of how we really make it into heaven. And we want our families, our friends, our coworkers, our acquaintances to be able to make it into heaven as well. And you've called us the, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And you've given us the Holy Spirit that we could be empowered to be your witnesses around the world. And we pray that we would do so. I pray you would open up doors. I pray you would let our heart be, have, a, have a desire for the lost that the people that we know would not be shut out of the kingdom of God, but open up and give us opportunities and fill us with your spirit that the out of us would gush torrents of living water and we would be able to change people's eternities. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.